Welcome to another edition of Force Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am okay, Brian. How are you doing? We're on our second leg of the Triple Crown Series following the Kentucky Derby victory by Mage. Mage. Neither of us picked Mage, Matt. I... I always thought he was this really talented horse but i i think i felt i, I think i was a little pig-headed in thinking that another horse with only three lifetime starts would win the kentucky derby especially in this wide open field i was wrong our our other picks though matt there's yeah. made the cover boy other picks though did pretty well um angel of empire two fills disarm these were horses that we were betting yeah, I threw in Mage in my pick threes. Luckily, uh, I know you were sitting there with Angel of Empire, two fills, and disarm in your two-day wagers. Yeah, and and I, and I was alive in three-day wagers because I think we did a nice job, also handicapping the Kentucky Oaks with our uh, long shot picks in our top threes. Uh, finishing first and second in there and i think that obviously propelled us both in the uh to be alive in the two-day double and and for me in the two-day pick three where i ended up finishing second third and fourth and if any of them had won it but yeah i guess i was you know one of those many people who just for me, I guess Mage fell into the category of you just can't use everybody. Yeah, Mage had run a um, a race in the Florida Derby, which was good enough to strongly consider. For me, it just boiled down to inexperience, and that's why he wasn't one of my main contenders. Um, hopefully, people listened with Up to the Mark. That was my single. That made it a winning weekend for me. And I, I know I mentioned it on Horse Center last week. Uh, Up to the Mark looked impressive, winning the Turf Classic, the race before the Derby. As Matt alluded to, our two long shots, our, our top pick in the Kentucky Oaks came up just empty at the head of the stretch. Top long had nothing. Sorry about that. But our two long shot pits, as Matt said, Matt's long shot pick, pretty mischievous one. My long shot pick, Gambling Girl, was second. So hopefully that helped a few people out. Matt, Mage was impressive. Uh, we are looking at a good field, I think coming out of the Kentucky Derby. They're not all going to be in the Preakness and Fast. Most of them aren't, but we're going to get the winner, Mayish. Here he is revving up in the stretch. He made a quick move after two fills. I was getting excited because two fills was my top horse and, and would have been my top uh, uh, winner as far as cashing tickets. But Mayish made a quick move, a decisive move. In fact, him and Angel of Empire were together pretty much on the turn Javier was able to get the jump on Angel of Empire, and he made a quick move on two fills. Yeah, he's <clears throat> he certainly did, Brian. Excuse me. Uh, and it was another year where that you know uh, uh, that handicapping tool in the Derby of say of saying, hey, you got to have a horse that's going to be on the lead or in second place at the eighth pole. Um, and, and so often that is true, and it certainly was in this derby because that meant two fills and Mage, and they finished one too. Yeah, there's there's another look at Mage winding up. You see him uh, moving best of all there on the outside. Two fills had taken the lead by this point as they're turning for home. A nice move by Jockey Jareth Lovebur Loveberry. I will say that of all the horses that uh, track the pace, and this, again, for the second straight year, Matt, became a very strong early pace in the Kentucky Derby. Of all the horses that were close, were really close to that pace, it was two fills as the real, the only horse that really stuck around the whole race. Oh, yeah, for sure, Brian. And and that was an, a very commendable effort by uh, two fills because, as you said, <clears throat> the pace just didn't come up a little fast like – People were thinking the pace came up very fast, as often happens in the Derby, in the heat of everything, and and the, the large field. And uh, two fills was right there in that pace the entire way, and hung on so gamely uh, all the way down the stretch to get 
within a length of the Kentucky Derby victory. Yeah, yeah. It was a small length at the wire. Two fills kept fighting yeah. on, but Mage had the momentum and uh, the stronger finish. Mage came from well back, Matt, as did Angel of Empire. And uh, there we see close to the wire or just about at the wire, Mage crossing first, two fills vanquished in second angel of empire was really running big in third uh, i mentioned that it was uh, a great ride by javier castellano getting the jump on flavian prod and angel of empire at a key juncture on the turn and and maybe that was the difference i don't want to take anything away from mage by the way i think all three of these horses ran really big races i think it was a very good kentucky derby uh angel of empire it's hard to take much away from what he did as well, coming from well back also. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, <clears throat> you, you you can't say enough about the uh, ride from Javier Castellano, the Hall of Famer, the, the four times Eclipse Award winner who had a, a empty spot on that wonderful resume, which was a Kentucky Derby win. This was his 16th, Brian, 16th start. Um, in the Kentucky Derby. And I'll tell you, Brian, that was a perfect, perfect ride by Javi, one of the most liked jockeys in the country. Um, he went into the race thinking and knowing that Mays had not broken well um, in recent starts. And when he didn't break well again here, Javi did not panic. He took it in stride. I think he had a plan in mind, which was to get over and save ground, which he did. Everything went perfectly. He got to the outside. He knew he had plenty of horses, and on he went. And here's a another one, another wonderful picture from our friends at Eclipse Sports Wire, um, who is uh, who took the photos that you're seeing in the show of uh, Javi being congratulated by, I think it's Junior Alvarado, uh, um, after the Kentucky Derby, knowing well that uh, he certainly deserved to get his Derby win. Yeah, 0 for 15, he's, he's off the Kentucky Derby shine. You're right, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the truly nice guys uh, in, in raising Javier Castellano, uh, maybe his very best most dominant years are behind him but uh after 15 unsuccessful attempts in the kentucky derby it was nice to see javier castellano as well as the venezuelan connections gustavo delgado his son is important to the barn uh so many uh owners uh uh it, it was a nice uh, a nice winner circle uh and there you see congratulations for javi uh, javier Castellano soon after winning his first Kentucky Derby. Now, Matt, that, that's a kind of a feel-good story out of the Kentucky Derby. There were lots of negative stories uh, of horse deaths uh, uh, in the week at Churchill Downs, unfortunately, and Kentucky Derby Day. Uh, then we had all the scratches in the Kentucky Derby, and uh, it was shocking. My top three picks before the race or, or the days leading up to the race included two Phil's practical move as my top pick, actually and Forte. So two of my top three were scratched uh, uh, before they got into the starting gate of the Kentucky Derby. Forte, I think, is the big story, and it's a continuing story now, Matt. Uh, 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 it, it's, it sure seemed like Rapoli, the ownership team, including Vinny Viola, and trainer, of course, Hall of Fame trainer Todd Fletcher, wanted to run Forte in the Kentucky Derby. They thought a bruise that he uh, uh, suffered earlier in the week was uh, healed up, and he was okay to go. But the uh, uh, Kentucky Horse Racing Commission, the uh, veterinarians on hand, the head veterinarian said, no, Forte is a scratch. Yeah, that certainly is uh, is what happened. <clears throat> and I don't know, you know, what, how, what the thinking was. I'm sure they were all just so focused on the Kentucky Derby, um, not thinking about, well, if he doesn't get in the race, then we might want to go to the Preakness. Uh, Pletcher doesn't send a lot of horses into the Preakness, but in this case, maybe they would. But now it turns out they can't because uh, he's on a 14-day vet list, so he can't be entered. Um, so it's all turned out to be, a, you know, a, a less than positive uh, a circumstance for connections that, you know, have done a lot for racing. Yeah, it, I 
everything that happens uh, in in racing with this three year crop, Matt, I'm just calling it a hit show. Uh, <laughs> who actually ran a pretty good race to be fifth in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, it is a bit of a hit show, and now we find out that Forte has a positive test after the hopeful. Um, I didn't do the math, Matt. That's uh, what nine months later, eight months later, something yeah. ridiculous. Uh, the transparency in racing still has big problems, and for that to come out now so long after the hopeful is ridiculous. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if it was something that was hidden, Brian. I think in the back of my mind, I remember hearing something about it, but it, you know, uh, uh, with the legal process, they have not gotten around to uh, 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 hearing the case until yesterday supposedly but i haven't heard anything about what happened with with that uh yesterday if in fact anything uh did happen at the the new york state gaming commission hearing yeah and uh, getting back to the preakness we're 99 percent sure forte won't run as it stands now legally he can't run off the 14-day vet list which was uh, determined on Kentucky Derby morning when he was officially scratched. So he won't be allowed to run in the Preakness. I guess there's always a chance for some legal uh, maneuverings made by his connections to get him into the Preakness. I don't think that's going to happen. So where it stands now, the two-year-old champion, the horse that beat Mage in the Florida Derby and the Fountain of Youth beat Mage in both meetings, is out of the Derby and now out of the Preakness. So what does that leave us for the Preakness, Matt? We know two fills doesn't want to come back in two weeks. It looks like uh, the same for Angel of Empire, the horses who ran so well to be second and third behind Mage in the Kentucky Derby. Looks like we have a field of nine probables now. We uh, we attached some odds, some early odds for the Preakness. If this is a nine horse field, this is how the betting might look now. We have the Kentucky Derby winner there on top, Matt, and uh, clearly, Four lifetime races, he's getting better by the start. Yeah, getting better by the start. And as we know, historically, uh, horses from the Kentucky Derby coming back on two weeks uh, in the Preakness typically run very well and, and are able to hold their form for another couple weeks. Um, you know, obviously the difficulty comes when you, if you try and go to the Belmont after that. And we're talking about Mage, lightly raced horse, as we said, going into the Derby, uh, um, uh, ran a terrific race to win the Kentucky Derby, a race that maybe didn't take as much out of him as obviously uh, it would to two fills who battle on that pace all the way, uh, all the way around the track. Um, so I think we have, what, three horses coming out of the Derby and Mage, fourth place finisher, Disarm, and Confidence Game, who I think was 10th. That's right, Matt. Three of the Kentucky Derby horses are coming back uh, I I into this Preakness. So that leaves six, what they usually call as new shooters for the Preakness. Mage looks like the horse to beat. If he can run a race back to the Derby, uh, I think he's a likely winner of this Preakness. Uh, even if he runs back to his performance in the Florida Derby, uh, I think he'll be tough to beat in the Preakness. Certainly the horse to beat, the likely favorite. But I think First Mission is going to get a whole lot of money. I don't know if he deserves to be really, really close to Mage in the betting, but I, I think it's going to happen. I think the Brad Cox trainee, a son of street sense, will be well-liked in the days and the hours leading up to the Preakness. Yeah, as, as most uh, Brad Cox horses are lately, they get a lot of action. And and First Mission, who we was last seen winning the Lexington Stakes at Keeneland, and and before that was a maiden special weight winner at Fairgrounds, also has a second in a maiden special weight, which, interesting, was behind a horse named uh, Bishop's Bay, another uh, Brad Cox horse who is probably going to be the favorite in the Peter Pan this weekend. Yeah. Bishop Spay has been well liked and they met in their first, uh, both of their debuts and uh, Bishop Spay held off first mission, but first mission has continued to move forward quickly, a big maiden win after that. And then in the Lexington, he was very game 
Uh, the horse on the lead, the backward horse on the lead was not giving up. And first mission was very game coming up the rail to win that Lexington Stakes, the grade three mile and a 16th. So he'll have to stretch out another eighth of the mile for the Preakness. Of note, I guess, Disarm, fourth in the Kentucky Derby. Although he's been kind of doing that, and maybe that's a distance he preferred more than the mile and 16th in the Lexington, but Disarm was fourth in the Kentucky Derby. He was third behind first mission in the Lexington Stakes. So that kind of flatters the performance by first mission in the Lexington. Son of Street Sense, as Matt said, trained by Brad Cox. Disarm, there's Disarm. Third choice, um, he's kind of uh, hanging around in these races. He's 0 for 4 this year. He certainly hasn't run a bad race. He's kind of hanging around. That's what he did in the Derby. I think there was a little separation now from the top three and the rest of the field for me in the Kentucky Derby. But Disarm, a son of Gunrunner, was best of the rest for trainer Steve Asmussen. Yeah, he was, Brian, and I agree. I think there was, you know, the top three and then Disarm, you know, and I watched his race very carefully and watched the replay several times because I, you know, uh, would have had an absolutely huge day if Disarm had won. But he got a pretty clean, clean trip. No excuses from the trip. Um, but, you know, coming down the stretch, beat everybody else to finish fourth, but really was didn't look like he was going to overtake any of the top three. Yeah, I agree with you. Disarm has kind of done what Disarm has done this year. He's, he's kind of hung around. He's made some ground up, but he's never looked like a winner in any of those four races. But another good performance in the Kentucky Derby. He's still eligible to move forward a little bit here in the Preakness. Getting back to our list, National Treasure is interesting. Uh, one of the most interesting things about National Treasure is his trainer, Bob Baffert, couldn't run in the Kentucky Derby, couldn't run in the Kentucky Derby the last two years. Or, Baffert trained horses, that is. But Baffert has owned the Preakness in the last quarter century, Matt. Baffert has won seven editions of the Preakness Stakes. Yeah, and Baffert <clears throat> is one of the reasons uh, why I mentioned how well Kentucky Derby horses have done moving two weeks into the Preakness. And Baffert's a big reason for that, Brian. Uh, uh, he's been able to do that better than everybody, but National Treasure's not one of them. He didn't run in the Derby. Yeah, National Treasure was uh, one of the few horses to stay with Baffert. Their connection sticking with Baffert, and this horse has been pointed for the Preakness. He missed some training time after he finished third in the Sham. Came back with a, maybe a better than it looks on paper fourth in the Santa Anita Derby. He was definitely still running uh, in the stretch of that Santa Anita Derby, but he was fourth behind practical move there. So his two races this year don't jump out off the page as, hey, look at me. But remember, he was a very good two-year-old. He's been pointed for the uh, Preakness. He missed a little bit of time. His Santa Anita Derby was decent. He might be ready to run his best race yet in the Preakness. Yeah, he might. Or he might be another horse like Disarm, who uh, um, has got a nice maiden victory, but since then has been hanging around, running well um, in a variety of stakes races, but hasn't been able to get a win. Yeah, Red Route 1 finally got a win last time, Matt. Uh, Red Route 1 had been over in many stakes attempts, mostly graded stakes attempts. He had rallied nicely in a bunch. Second in the Rebel, the day I was down there behind confidence game. Red Route 1 was an impressive winner last time because, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a super field that he was beating in a listed stake that uh, feeds into the Preakness at Oaklawn Park last time. But the way he rushed to the leader's late in that race was pretty darn impressive yeah and another one for us uh, for trainer steve asmussen who we know when his horses are good he's going to take a shot we'll see if uh that stakes win that you mentioned at oakland park is a sign that he's ready to move on or when he gets into graded stakes company here he'll be back to you know not quite getting there one of the horses that it occurs to me in this Preakness without a lot of speed. Mage has been rallying lately. Uh, Red Route 1 has no speed. It doesn't look like Perform has any speed. Disarm doesn't have a lot of speed. So there's only a few horses on this list, Matt, that have at least some early speed. First Mission could be one of them. National Treasure could be another. Also Confidence Game, the horse that beat Red Route 1 
in the Rebel. He's got some speed. Uh, a long gap between that Rebel win into the Kentucky Derby, 10 weeks, in fact. He chased that fast pace on Derby Day, and he faded to finish 10th in the middle of the pack, as you said. But it occurs to me with the layoff and, and then the fast pace in the Kentucky Derby confidence game is a horse who is eligible to move forward in the Preakness. Yeah, and for all of us that didn't want to play confidence game, and I guess rightly so, because of that long layoff between the Rebel and the first Saturday in May, um, I guess we should say, well, he got a pretty good tightener in the Kentucky Derby and ran well for a part of the race. Will he be ready to make a step forward? Handicapping uh, uh, rules say, yeah, probably. Yeah, less speed in the Preakness, less horses in the Preakness, less graded stakes winners in the Preakness. I, I would consider confidence game here as one of the early pace uh, horses in the Preakness. We always talk about connections, and uh, right now, I don't know if there are any better connections in American racing than Blazing Sevens, chained by Chad Brown. He'll be ridden by Irad Ortiz Jr. Blazing Sevens, another horse like uh, National Treasure, who's been slightly disappointing at three, but he's only had two starts, and he might be on the improve. Yeah, and, uh, and Chad Brown, as I think you were alluding to, has done very well with horses uh, that look like they were going to go into the Derby, but then he decides for, you know, various circumstances to skip the Derby and go to the Preakness. And, and he's done very well with uh, picking up a couple of Preakness victories. I don't know if uh, uh, Blazing Sevens is of the caliber of uh, uh, his Preakness winners, his form is a little hard to figure. Last time out, he was third in the bluegrass, and many people felt the bluegrass was a big race uh, heading into the Derby. But I don't know, Bry, those uh, bluegrass runners in the Derby did not do particularly well. Yeah, that's right. Tapich, Rice, and Verifying, the two main participants in the bluegrass stakes, did not uh, do much in the Kentucky Derby perhaps uh, making Blazing Sevens not look as good, but third race, he improved in the Bluegrass to be third, picks up by Rad Ortiz. Brown is talking about how well the son of good magic is training for the Preakness. Uh, Matt, he's one of three sons of good magic. We talked about Red Route 1 and Disarm, two sons of Gunrunner, but there, there's the Derby winner, Mage, a son of good magic. There's Blazing Sevens, a grade one winner of good magic, and then you have perform for trainer Shug McGahey, also a son of good magic. Yeah, another one of the young sires who is doing extremely well and is going to be a big influence, I think, for many years to come. Yeah, perform uh, did not look like a graded stakes horse uh, all that long ago. He was actually uh, in a race against Mage when Mage was debuting. Perf perform was sprinting back then. And uh, Mage beat him pretty easily in that seven furlong maiden race. But since then, Perform, as horses sometimes tend to do for trainer Shug McGahey, Perform has really turned it on, uh, winning a maiden nicely. And then last time in the Federico Tessio, you know, it wasn't a graded stakes and there weren't great horses, but there were some decent Maryland horses in there, stakes performers. And the trouble that he had in the stretch and still somehow got up and uh, won the race was Almost incredible, Matt. So I think more than anything, not only was that an impressive looking victory, but the fact that he is really improving now makes me think that perform might be a long shot to watch in the Preakness. Yeah, and and, and the Tessio is often a path that, that uh, some trainers will take because the winner gets a guaranteed spot in the Preakness. Yeah, uh, that, that was at Laurel uh, in Maryland. But uh, yeah, certainly a, a Maryland uh, gateway, if you will to the Preakness. And the last horse on the list, Matt, um, certainly will be the longest shot of these nine, at least. Uh, it, his name is Chase the Chaos. If you've been following the career of uh, Stiletto Boy, uh, a fan favorite uh, who's uh, run on so many good races and, and won the big cap earlier this year, Chase the Chaos comes from the barn of Ed, Ed, Mo, uh, Ed Mojer Jr. And uh, that's the same barn as Stiletto. Chase the Chaos was doing quite well up in Golden Gate Fields, including a prep for the Preakness, winning that one. But then when he came down 
to Southern California, he did not perform well in the San Felipe. Yeah, and, and certainly uh, you mentioned those races at Golden Gate that are on an artificial surface. So maybe the surface switch uh, had a lot to do it, but no doubt he is here in the Preakness because the winner of the El Camino Real Derby, which uh, uh, was Chase the Chaos this year, uh, also gets a guaranteed spot in the Preakness. Yeah, if you can somehow draw a, a line through the San Felipe when he finished a mile behind practical move, maybe you consider him as a long shot. But as Matt said, those Golden Gate performances came on an all-weather surface. So I don't know. He looks like a long shot, to say the least. All right, Matt, that's nine horses we're looking at for the Preakness. Uh, we, of course, next week will have a big uh, edition of Horse Center talking about some of the other races but really diving into the, the field after the draw and the morning line is set. We hope you enjoyed our early look at the Preakness. Matt, I want to ask you, out of this field, I'll throw it up one more time. Is there any long shots in there that catch your eye as a potential stumbling block towards Mage as he goes after a potential triple crown? I don't know, Brian. Coming uh, into, uh, into the show, I didn't really think so, but you made a really good case uh, talking about the trips that uh, Red, Root, Red Root won and Perform had in their races uh, heading into the Preakness. Uh, you made a really good case for us to take a look at those replays, and maybe those two are worth consideration. There you go. Uh, for me, this race boils down to, will Mage run the same kind of race he ran in the Kentucky Derby, because I, I think if he does, he wins this. Uh, there's also the pace consideration of fast pace in the Kentucky Derby, less of that uh, in the Preakness, it, it certainly looks like. So if Mage can run his best, he wins this. But I, then I think I look at the list and maybe the next seven horses are all at least somewhat interesting, if unproven. But it certainly would look like Mage has a lesser field to deal with in the Preakness, the second leg. Uh, than he did in the Kentucky Derby. Matt, can I get a parting shot from you before we leave? Yeah, that's for sure, Brian. Only nine horses and such in there, uh, which is often the case in the Preakness. Uh, um, we'll be back next week uh, after the draw. It looks like the field probably isn't going to change too significantly uh, uh, from this point. And uh, hope you had some success in the Derby, some excitement, some horses alive. And again, thanks for watching this show. Yeah, thank you all for watching. We hope you had a great Kentucky Derby. We're looking forward to the Preakness nine days away now as we uh, tape this on Thursday. Thanks to Eclipse Sportswire for the great photos from the Kentucky Derby. And, uh, of course, our sponsor. Thank you to Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Folks, we look forward to seeing you next week after the Preakness draw right here on Horse Center.